So won't you sign me up? Sign me up for the Christian Jubilee. Won't you write my name? Write my name on the road. I've been changed. I've been changed since the Lord has lifted me. I want to be ready, ready when Jesus comes. So won't you sign me up? Sign me up for the Good evening. My name is Mark Syme. I am the minister of the Northfield Church of Christ in Northfield, New Jersey. I would like to extend this opportunity to welcome you to our PM services for Sunday, August the 25th. Uh, here at Northfield, we sing from the songbook entitled Songs of Faith and Praise. Don't know if you have that book, if you'd like to sing along with us, but if you do, We'll give you the number and the name of the song, and uh, if you have a different book or you have some way to access the song, we'll give you a moment or two uh, so that you can praise the Lord in <laughs> song with us. The first song that we will sing this morning is number 586, My Faith Looks Up to Thee. My Faith Looks Up to Thee. <clears throat> My faith looks up to thee, the Lamb of Calvary, Savior divine. Now hear me when I pray, take all my guilt away. Oh, let me from this day be holy thine. May thy rich grace impart strength to my fainting heart. My zeal inspire. As thou hast died for me, oh, may my love to thee, pure, warm, and changeless be, a living fire. When ends life's transient dream, when death's gold solemn stream, shall o'er me roll. Bless Savior then in love, fear and distrust. Remove, oh, bear me safe above a ransom soul. Our next song will be number 246, Let Me Be a Sacrifice. 246, Let Me Be a Sacrifice. We'll sing it through twice. Let me be a sacrifice, holy and acceptable. Let me be a sacrifice, consumed in your praise. Let me be a sacrifice, holy and acceptable. Let me be a sacrifice, Worshipping your name, let me be a sacrifice, holy and acceptable. Let me be a sacrifice, consumed in your praise. Let me be a sacrifice, holy and acceptable. 
Let me be a sacrifice, worshiping your name. And before the Lord's Supper, to prepare our minds, we'll sing number 354, I gave my life for thee. 354, I gave my life for thee. <coughs> I gave my life for thee, my precious blood I shed, that thou my ransom be, and quicken from the dead. I gave, I gave my life for thee, what hast thou given for me? I gave, I gave my life for thee. What hast thou given for me? My father's house of light, my glory circle throne. I left for earthly night, for wandering sad and lone. I left I left it all for thee, hast thou left all for me? I left, I left it all for thee, hast thou left all for me? He sighed, I have suffered much, more than I can can tell. A bitterest agony to rescue thee from hell. I born, I born it all for thee. What hast thou born for me? I born, I born it all for thee. What hast thou born for me? And I have brought to thee down from my home above salvation full and free, my pardon and my love. I bring, I bring rich gifts to thee. What hast thou brought for me? I bring, I bring rich gifts for thee. What hast thou brought for me? The song that we sang was um, Jesus talking about his sacrifice. And it was a song from his perspective. Uh, I gave my life for thee. Uh, the, the terms are in second person that Jesus is talking about himself and what he has done for us. And so as we gather around the table, I think it's important for us to remember exactly what Jesus did indeed do for us. He, he gave his life for us. Uh, he shed his precious blood for us. And he exclaims that, and the writer of this song reflects that. And so as we gather about the table, let's indeed uh, remember what Jesus uh, did for each one of us by going to the cross, by dying, uh, by shedding his innocent blood. And through that, we have redemption. We have the possibility of sanctification. We have the possibility of forgiveness of sins all through that act that Jesus gave his life for each one of us. And so as we gather about the table, let's keep that firmly in our minds. What Jesus did indeed do for us as a one-time perfect sacrifice that our sins might be forgiven. Let's pray for the bread. Our Heavenly Father, we're so grateful that in your divine wisdom that at just the right time you sent Jesus to us. And as we now reflect on uh, Jesus on the cross, 
on his ultimate sacrifice. Uh, we remember his body racked in pain uh, as nails were driven into his hands and into his feet. And so as we take of this bread, we remember his body given in our stead, what he gave for us through you. As we partake, help us to hearken back to Calvary and the sacrifice that was made for us. We pray this in his most holy name. Amen. The second line of the song is, uh, by precious blood I shed. Jesus allowed the life-giving blood to flow from his body, knowing uh, very much uh, alike uh, the day of the original Passover when the angel of death uh, passed over the houses of those who put the blood of the lamb on the lamppost that through the blood of Jesus Christ, we have forgiveness of sins. And so as we partake, help us to remember that the blood of Jesus is a life-giving blood. It's a blood that leads to forgiveness. Let's pray for the fruit of the vine. Our God and Heavenly Father, we're grateful for this time that we can gather about your table. And at this particular moment to remember the innocent blood that your son shed for us. And as we think of the blood flowing from his head and from his hands and from his feet, we know that through that blood that we uh, can have our sins forgiven and washed away, that your grace can be upon us. So as we partake, let's be mindful of those things. We pray this in his most holy name. Amen. With the Lord's Supper completed, also on the first day of the week, we, were, we are commanded to lay by in store. We're to lay by in store that which uh, we have um, been blessed with. Isn't it amazing the blessings of life? And isn't it amazing that all those blessings come from you? And so at this time, we want to return uh, that financial uh, blessing back to you and give you but your own. Uh, we know that uh, uh, for the church, your kingdom here on earth to function the way it needs to function, that money is necessary. And with that, as we give, uh, we just pray that these monies will be utilized uh, the way they are supposed to. Uh, let's pray. We thank you, dear Heavenly Father, for the opportunity that we have to give. Help us to give with a cheerful heart. Help us to give with an opened wallet or pocketbook. Help us to purpose to give. Help us during the week to remember uh, that Sunday is a day of giving and give as we have prospered. Bless us in our giving. Help us to understand how it reflects Jesus giving his life for us. Bless us and help us to be the givers that we should be. We pray this in his most holy name. Amen. And the last song that we will sing uh, comes from the uh, 56th Psalm in verse 3, when it says, My word is a lamp unto your feet and a light to your path. Thy word, number 449. Thy word, 449. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. When I feel afraid, think I've lost my way, still you're there right beside me. 
Nothing will I fear as long as you are near. Please be near me to the end. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. That concludes the uh, song part of our service. I know that the Lord was blessed in our song and our praise of him. We praise our Lord because he is deserving of that praise. He is our God and he sent Jesus to us. Uh, I know it's been a couple of weeks since uh, we uh, uh, had an evening service. Uh, there were extenuating, extenuating circumstances in the Syme household regarding our grandchildren. And uh, with that in mind, we want to get back on track and, and get these evening services going. About three weeks ago, I told you I started a series of lessons entitled The Way of Christ. Now, the last time, the first lesson under the way of Christ was the way to God. This evening, the title of the lesson under the way of Christ is the way to truth. And so everything is going to revolve around the term truth this evening. The way of Christ is not only the way to God, but it is the way to truth. Jesus came into this world to bear witness of the truth. He said that in John chapter 18 and verse 37. And with that, uh, in John 1, 14 to 17, he says to us that he was full of grace and full of truth. As a matter of fact, not only that, but Jesus is the truth. In John chapter uh, 14 and verse 6, it says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And he goes on by saying, no one comes to the Father except by me. Why? Because Jesus is not only the way, but he is the truth. And so to appreciate that, I think that maybe it's important for us to do a little study on what the truth actually is. By answering a question, interestingly enough, that was asked by all people, uh, Pontius Pilate, when Jesus was brought before him on the night in which he was betrayed. And so after doing some questioning in uh, John chapter 18, verse 38, Pilate asked him, what is the truth? Now, an interesting question. And it would be interesting coming from Pilate because Pilate was a man of the world. He was not a religious person. And so with that in mind, many today view the truth as something that is relative. And I want to dispel that this evening when it comes to understanding Jesus Christ, the way to truth. Uh, many take this uh, relativistic uh, view of truth uh, and, and say, well, you know what? What might be true for you is not true for me. And this is contrary to the correspondence view of truth what it constitutes and what it is made of is factual reality, which is what I want to share with you this evening. And so with that in mind, let's look at the meaning of truth. Very often we go back to some Greek words, and I've uh, explained to you before that I am not a Greek scholar, but uh, I can have Greek words presented to me in their definition and see how they fit into the scriptures. First of all, 
The term true, one of the Greek words is aletheia. I'm sorry, elites, elites. And what the word elites means is unconcealed, manifest, actually. It is true to fact. Notice true to fact. No, nothing relative here. True to fact. Another terminology as alethinos, alethinos. And this means, uh, uh, it denotes true in the sense of real and ideal and genuine. Again, there's no relativity here. There's no what's good for you is good for me or not good for me. And finally, the term truth, the Greek word is aletheia. Aletheia, and it is objectively signifying the reality lying at the basis of an appearance and manifested veritable essence of a matter, the very essence of something. When we get to the essence of something, there's no relativity. The essence of something is what it truly is. And so with that in mind, let's get to what the Bible says regarding truth. In the Old Testament, in Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 4, it tells us that God is truth. And Jesus said this about himself several times in the Gospel of John. In John chapter 14, verse 6, John chapter 1, verse 14, and John chapter 8, verse 45. Jesus is the truth. Jesus is full of truth. And Jesus spoke the truth. None of these are relative things. Jesus talked about factual matters. And when we look at our Bibles, they are the Holy Spirit-inspired words of God. What's that mean? It means they are the truth. The Holy Spirit, according to John 14, 17, is the spirit of truth. And with that, and uh, correlating those two, John 17, 17 tells us that the word of God is truth. And so the judgments of God are according to the truth. Now, we're going to get to this in just a few minutes. The, the Bible asserts, and to me, rightfully so, that God is true. God is real. And he reveals the truth to us. <laughs> in today's terminology, God makes it real. He's speaking in reality terms. And we, when we get judged on that day of judgment, we will get judged whether we behaved according to the truth. And so when Jesus came to say that he bore witness to the truth, it means that he proclaims things as they are in fact, not opinion, not relative. Denying it won't change it. Denying reality does not change reality. We put our hand into fire and it's hot. That's reality. We can't change that. And truth is much like that. With us, this understanding, let's consider for a few moments about Jesus as the way to the truth. First, Jesus said to us that truth is knowable. In other words, we can comprehend that truth. John 8, 32 has some famous words. It says, you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. Not some relative abstract term. It's the truth is what's real. And his doctrine reveals the truth. In John chapter 8, verses 31 to 32, he tells us, to continue in the truth. And so when Jesus died, he promised the uh, disciples 
that the truth would come upon them, that they would get a comforter and a helper, according to John 14, uh, 26. And so with that, on the day of Pentecost, uh, the apostles became the source and the repository of his truth. And so when Peter preached that famous sermon on the day of Pentecost, and many were baptized, what were they baptized? They were baptized through the truth of what God wanted them to do through Jesus Christ. The truth that Jesus wants us to know is knowable and has been revealed by first him and then by the apostles. And what is the realm of truth, you might ask? Well, the realm of truth today, I believe, resides in the kingdom of God here on earth. That is the rule or reign of God in our lives. Jesus taught us that he was coming near. And he taught us that there should be priority in our lives. That's why we have that famous Matthew 6, verse 33, Seek first the kingdom of God. That's our priority, seeking God's kingdom. He taught that. And with that, he bore witness to the nature of this kingdom. The kingdom is God's residence on earth today. That's what the church is. That's what Jesus gave his life up for so that the church would be established. Now, with that, we have another reality. We have the reality of sin. Sin, if we're not careful, can enslave us. However, according to John 8, verse 31 to 36, Jesus' truth, his doctrine can set us free from sin. His truth reveals to us how we should live righteous and holy lives. We should engender Galatians 5, 22, the fruit of the spirit, those virtues or characteristics that set us aside from worldly people. And so the, the truth of God's word reveals to us how we are to live righteous and holy lives, not blinded by those that are hardened by sin, according to Ephesians 4, 17 to 19. But those a little bit further on in, G in Ephesians 4, 20 to uh, 22, those of us that are renewed, what are we renewed by? <laughs> We're renewed by the truth of God's word. There is the reality of the resurrection and the day of judgment. The most important event that happened on the face of the earth was Jesus being raised from the dead. And he taught us very, very succinctly in John 5, uh, 28 to 29, he explains the fact of the, res the resurrection. And he taught us that his words would be the judge for us as to whether we would live eternally with him. His own resurrection from the dead is proof of this. And so uh, the truth Jesus wants us to know relates to living under this liberating rule of God rather than the bondage and the guilt of sin. Finally, we must follow Jesus as the way of truth. There are many in the world that will not. Jesus in Matthew 7 verses 13 to 14 told us that broad is the way that leads to destruction, but narrow is the way that leads to him. Many will go down that broad way to destruction. Many will even fake it. 
<laughs> in Matthew 7, 21 to 23, it says, many of you uh, say, Lord, Lord, but don't do the things that I say. Those are people that are faking abiding in the truth. Uh, to Timothy, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, Paul explained to his protege, Timothy, that many will turn from the truth. They will have itching ears because people will try to, to throw things in that just aren't the reality of what God's word is all about. With that, Christians, the way of truth can be a lonely road. Now, let's forget about the people that don't. Let's remember the people that do. In John, now second John, uh, chapter one, verses one through six, John explains to them how great he felt when he found out that uh, the, the people that he had associated with were walking in truth and walking in love. And in 2 Timothy 2, verses 24 to 26, in essence, what he told Timothy was, you can't do it all. You has, have to entrust the truth to faithful men so they can also teach the truth of God's word. Knowing truth is no excuse for arrogance. It's no excuse for self-righteousness. As we conclude, when we look at the world, uh, we look at the world in such a way that uh, the the world is a great uh, is in great moral uncertainty. Many no longer understand what's right and wrong. Many claim that there is no right and wrong. Thus, they stumble into moral darkness, where Jesus is the light. And because they fall into that moral darkness, uh, they can't have as that last song that we sang, Jesus is a lamp unto our feet and a light to our path. Let me tell you in unequivocal terms, the way of Christ is the way to truth. Jesus said in John eight twelve that he is the light of the world and that those who abide in him will not abide in darkness. Being, seeing things as they really are, seeing reality, our lives can be saved by the truth that God supplies to us. The Holy Spirit inspired truth not relative, not it, it may be good for you, it's not good for me. The only way to get to God is by following the truth of God's word. And on judgment day, we will be judged by whether we followed that truth. The ones that are going to meet with the Lord forever are those who have taken uh, Jesus into their lives who have proclaimed Jesus as the Son of God, who have said, I don't want to live in moral darkness and repented of their sins. And finally, they have been baptized as instructed in many New Testament scriptures for the forgiveness of their sins. And with that in mind, if you haven't made that commitment to the Lord, unfortunately, you will walk down that wide path instead of down the narrow one, the narrow one that leads to God. If you want to go down that narrow path, you must be a child of God. And so we offer you that invitation. If you need to come to God through Jesus Christ, now is the time to respond. If you must respond immediately, get in touch with one of us so that we can help you. Let's close in prayer. Our God and Heavenly Father, we're grateful for the truth of your word. We're grateful for the truth that guides our life. That is a lamp unto our path and a light for each of us to follow. Help us as your truth is the light of the world to be the lights that we ought to be. 
Help us to be willing to share God's word with others, to get them on the right path, to get them on the path of truth. Continue to bless us, dear Heavenly Father, in our lives. Forgive us of our sins. Help us to walk down the moral pathway that leads to you. Comfort us, bless us. We pray this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. Be safe and may God bless you all. So won't you sign me up? Sign me up for the Christian Jubilee. Won't you write my name? Write my name on the road. I've been changed. I've been changed since the Lord has lifted me. I want to be ready, ready when Jesus comes. So won't you sign me up? Sign me up for the Christian Jubilee. Please won't you write my